Well, because you can't always play the game you want, welcome to The Game We're In. I'm Maya May, and I'm here with Senior Lincoln Project Strategist Trigvi Olson. So we're watching the hearings and the midterms because all of it is caught up in this just tangled autocratic web the GOP is trying to weave. This week, primaries are taking place in Maine, Nevada, South Carolina, and North Dakota. And if you're watching the January 6th hearings, you know Trump and his cronies grifted $250 million from his supporters and weaponized them against democracy. Why is that important to the midterms? Well, according to 538 of the more than 100 candidates Donald Trump endorsed in the midterms, more than 70% believe the 2020 election was fraudulent. Trigvi, every time they say Trump endorsed, I hear criminal endorsed. Have the January 6th hearings changed anything? Well, I, you know, when you gave that $250 million figure, I was thinking about the song by the Bodines, Good Work. I don't know how many <laughs> Bodines fans we have out there, but or that's bad pretty, work. Good work. pretty good work if you can get it. Um, you know, I, I think, have the, have the hearings changed anything? I think the hearings have been incredibly important. Um, they've reinforced things that we already knew. Um, they have been a reminder for people what's at stake in 2022 and beyond. And I thought we should maybe start it off with a little short clip of Chris Steyerwald, who used to be at Fox News. He was their chief political analyst. Um, I think he gets to the heart of a couple of important things. So let's roll that clip and uh, give people a chance to watch it, and then we'll talk about it. All right. And you have to understand, or in this room, you have you know the, the best people from academia, Democrats, Republicans, a broad cross-section of people who had worked together for a decade who are really serious about this stuff. So we knew it would be a consequential call because it was one of five states that really mattered, right? Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona were the ones that we were watching. We knew it would be significant to call any one of those five, but we already knew Trump's chances were very small and getting smaller based on what we had seen. So. We were able to make the call early. Uh, we were able to beat the competition. Uh, we looked around the room, everybody says yay, and on we go. And by the time we found out how much everybody was freaking out and losing their minds over this call, we were already trying to call the next state. We had already moved on. We were into Georgia, we were to North Carolina. We were looking at these other states. Uh, so we thought it was, we were pleased, but not surprised. So what I think is important, a couple of reminders in there, right? Number one, you had the president of the United States. He literally got Starwald probably fired from Fox News for calling Oh, Arizona, for sure. <laughs> right? Because he was angry. He was angry about the fact he lost the election. But, I mean, those calls are made with a lot put into them, and they're almost always right. Second thing is, you know, Starwall, and it's one of the reasons why I wanted to show this, he outlines exactly – where the most important races are in the country in 2022 for defending democracy. They're Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, you know, Arizona, Nevada. Those are the places that are ground, Georgia, that are ground zero right. in terms of def defending our democracy because they're going to be the same states that are playing the 2024 presidential election. And so governor's races, secretary of state's races, that's why we've really at the Lincoln Project focused on the idea of we're going to look at races in terms of how important are they for defending democracy. Right. And that brings up our defending democracy score, the defense of democracy score that your team put together. So before we move into the big primary stories, can you talk to us a little bit about what goes into scoring these primaries? Yeah, absolutely. And our regular watchers, you know, they're going to have seen this before. Um, we have three main strategic goals. First one is focus on winning critical races critical to the 2024 elections. Those are the things Starwall got at, you know, those states. Second, find opportunities to impact and retain control of democracy's guardrails. That may be the U.S. Senate. That can be the U.S. House. That can be state legislatures. That could be secretary of state's races around the country. Really delving into, from a strategic standpoint, so where are those opportunities? And then the last one is defeat and harass illiberal and autocratic actors and candidates and their enablers wherever possible. And that really gets to you know an ex how we scored these races, right? We use three metrics. The first metric is what we call of, of the 350 races around the country that we analyzed, the first metric is the 2024 score. How critical is the election to the outcome in 2024 from one to 10? And that can be anything from the state's congressional makeup to the electoral college implications, 
we really delved into what does it mean in terms of defending our democracy. Metric two is our control score. How important is it for control of those guardrails of democracy and defending them? past voting trends, you know, how is the race rated? How likely is it to flip? All of those things go into that score from one to five. And then the last one is the illiberalism score. You know, we're seeing, you know, if you are to think about people from, you know, a Liz Cheney, who's a one completely committed to democracy and demonstrating it, um, or a Nancy Pelosi, who's a would be a one, two, versus a Marjorie Taylor Greene, who would be a five. Yeah, off the charts. (laughs) You know, I'm going to show you. Starwell talked about Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania governor's race. People who who are fans of the Lincoln Project, you're going to see a lot of us about Pennsylvania over the next few months. You're going to see a lot about us talking about Pennsylvania over the next few days. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, that's a 20. It's one of the three biggest governor's races in the country, one of the three most important races, period, in the country. Doug Mastriano, election denier, just hired Jen Ellis, who was one of the attorneys that they were yeah. talking about who was trying to steal the election. We rate him a five. So that's really how the score works. And, and, and that's, you know, people who've watched the show before know that we've been talking about, we're going to talk about all the races later on, but um, that, that's how we're looking at this. How do we defend democracy in the United States? Right. And it's looking more and more that we need to keep uh, democracy out of Trump's tiny little hands. And he's got his hands all over uh, the race in Nevada because we've got to talk about uh, Nevada. Adam Laxalt, he's Trump's co-chair um, and he's leading in early voting, though Sam Brown, whose great grandpa founded the Cleveland Browns, is gaining ground. Trivi, how does this race score? Um you know, so this particular race right now, uh, it, you know, it, the, the primary itself doesn't score that high, mm-hmm. but the general election scores at 17, which makes it one of the most important uh, Senate races in the country between whoever prevails between Laxalt and Brown, most likely Laxalt, and uh, Catherine Cortez Mastow, who's the incumbent Democrat there. And, you know, We view it that way for a variety of reasons, one of which is, you know, Adam Laxalt has gone full MAGA. And it's ironic because, you know, Adam Laxalt's father was Pete Domenici, a longtime senator, moderate senator from New Mexico, you know, in the tradition of Western senators. And his great grandfather was was Paul Laxalt, who was the chairman of Ronald Reagan's campaign. Um, These are, uh, you know, prominent traditional Republican families. And yet Adam Laxalt is a complete election denier. It's nuts. Um, And we thought we'd show an ad, I think, Maya, didn't we, of of Adam Laxalt? Yeah, let's take a look at that. When government tried to strip our water and property rights, Adam Laxalt fought them and won. When they tried to take our gun rights away, Adam fought for us again and won. They tried to restrict our religious liberties, They tried to force amnesty for illegals, but Adam fought for us and won again and again. You can trust Adam Laxalt to fight for us and win because he always has. I'm Adam Laxalt and I approve this message. A lot of fighting in there. And I feel like right now I'm looking for somebody who knows how to collaborate and bring people together. This guy scares the crap out of me, Trigvi. You know, that ad, as we were watching it, I was thinking, you know, that's like the full mega burger ad, right? Like it's for, it's, it's super the mega. <laughs> it's, it is. It's got everything. It's got that cannon of a 44 mag yeah. in there. It's got the border wall. It's got a legal yeah. amnesty. Like they're punching every button that you could mm-hmm. want to punch, right? And again, you think about the guy's background, like it's just a classic case of somebody who's completely prostituting themselves. Uh, at the altar of Donald Trump and at the altar of this mega extremism radicalization that's going mm-hmm. on. And, and so the stakes in that Senate race are, are really massive. Now, Sam Brown, you know, he's a former army captain who served in Afghanistan and suffered an injury from an IED. But um, no real experience, right? He's, a, no. he's another fighter, but one without any real experience. <laughs> no. No, and, you know, Laxalt's run a couple of times before. He was the AG, but then he ran for governor. He's kind of a, you know, he's lost some races. Sam Brown, he's only run once before. Mm -hmm. um, And he's really trying to play up that he's not, you know, a 
a kid of you know power. He's not elite, he, <laughs> right? Except his grandfather founded the Cleveland Browns and owned yeah. them, right? So I mean, yeah. and now technically, as you know, as as a Green Bay Packer owner, Maya, right? Like sometimes people like you, Chicago Bears fans, get to uh, associate with us NFL owner types from from the north, but you know. <laughs> We're not really typical NFL owners, so I, you know I, I don't see. know. I can maybe I can maybe connect with what Brown's saying. Yeah, I, I can't connect with this one though, because again, he, you know, a lot of his ads are all about the fighting, the fighting, and it's again uh -huh. the, just assuming that because somebody is a veteran that they can come in and and fight this fight. And I, again, I think we need to like bring people together. That is this, this is what America needs right now. Uh, the governor's race is also a big race. Sisolak is in a tight, tight, tight race running against another big Trump guy, Sheriff Lombardo. And like to be a sheriff accepting an endorsement from a criminal is weird. Like what, in, what is the wild, what in the wild, wild west is going on over here? So here's the thing about Joe Lombardo. He is not even the craziest mega candidate in the race. What? I mean, and he, no, he's not. I mean, if we put the score up here, what you're going to see is, so we look at the Sisolak race. We score that at 17 also, although I'm going to tell you, Maya, back in the rating room, uh, mm -hmm. we are, uh, we're, we're kind of thinking about this one long and hard because Sisolak's campaign probably is going to have to be a driver of turnout. But mm -hmm. um, what you see here is, you know, there, there's another candidate in the race, like he's doing the full fist on thing. Um, this race has got elements of real uh, hardcore race to the bottom stuff going on. You know, I think Lombardo based on early voting is probably going to pull that off. I think for Cortez Mastow to win, you know, Sisolak, mm -hmm. if Sisolak loses, um, I think Cortez Masto sunk. I think he could have a scenario where Sisolak wins and Cortez Masto loses, but I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think Cortez Mastow wins and Sisolak loses, right? It's one of those races where that governor's race, and we're seeing this around the country, and it's why it's so important for people to engage in these governor's races. Mm -hmm. Governor's races are going to be drivers of turnout that are going to impact control of the United States Senate because across the, the, the election field, um, it, there's, these governor's races are happening where there's vulnerable Republican senators and, and in some cases vulnerable Democrat senators. Yeah, it's a, it's definitely a race to watch, but there's also some House races um, that we need to keep an eye on. District yeah. 3 incumbent. Susie Lee is looking vulnerable. Uh, what are you seeing in this race? How will the primary affect the midterms? You know, so you got you got three uh, you got three races really in Nevada. Susie Lee is, is the probably the most vulnerable, but we mm -hmm. scored them all the same. And you know, so it's it's Nevada one, three, and four. So two of them, one and four, are clustered on the suburbs of Vegas, right? So they're mm -hmm. sitting there right in the purple line, and then. Um, and then three, which is the, the Lee district, is, is north. Um, we score them all 12, so they're all scored kind of the same. Um, what, when we looked at that, right now, they're just kind of sitting there. But as you know, we go back and reevaluate these races all the time. I mean, we're, that's what we're doing at the Lincoln Project within the political universe. Um, you know, they're ones we're watching closely because if Sisolak right. starts to have problems or Cortez Massa starts to melt down, those races are going to go up because, you know, if Democrats lose those three House races in Nevada, they will not keep the majority in the, in the United States House under any circumstances losing those kinds of races. Um, and in fact, you would have a Republican majority that would be quite substantial, even if they lost one or two of them. So those races are ones to watch. They aren't, you know, essential for defending democracy right now, but they're ones that we're going to be keeping an eye on because they could work their way up into the into the top tier of races. All right, well, we'll um, keep an we're eye on that. Watching, yeah. <laughs> we're going to watch for those who are who are looking at the primaries after the primaries in Nevada tomorrow. You know, you're going to want to look at those races and see is it the Trumpy candidates are getting through? Kind of to your point earlier about Trump endorsements, right? Um, mm -hmm. his candidates are getting through in these places and they're getting through because up the ballot, you know, JD Vance is winning. He's pulling a bunch of more MAGA people through question is, are we going to see that in Nevada? And I think we are, 
I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of people who pull Laxalt and then pull the mega candidate down the down the chain. And do, do you think, though, that the hearings like we're seeing now, like how criminally minded the Republicans really are about overturning the election. So do you think that's going to speak to the people in Nevada? Do you think that, you know, even maybe the candidates, maybe they're going to use this, like maybe this is something that Susie Lee can grip onto or that Select can grip onto. Do you think they're going to do that? Well, I think they're going to have to in the general election. I mean, in the primary, mm -hmm. primary Republican primary voters, most of them are going to be, as you alluded to, 70% mm -hmm. of them probably believe the election was stolen and Nevada could be even right. higher. So it isn't, it isn't really a primary thing. And really, you know, the primaries in Nevada aren't, aren't things that we score that high. It's the general elections that are going to be impacted by those primaries that make it Nevada matter so much. Right. Um, but um, uh, I think in the general election, yeah, absolutely. Like Susie okay. Lee is going to have to use that amongst voters in places like Henderson or, you know, on those yeah. suburbs, ex suburbs of Vegas, there's going to be the Bannon line. And the, 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 along that Bannon line, which is the, the Republicans and conservative leaning independents who typically vote Republican, uh, she's going to have to get a bunch of them to cross over and almost and vote for her. All right. Well, we're going to keep our eye on that. We're also looking at Maine. There's a bellwether race there. We have somebody, Jared Golden, who is uh, defending a seat. What do you think about that? Yeah, so Maine, too, is one of those places that, um, you know, it, it's a vulnerable seat. Again, it's another one that we've scored 12. So it's not at the very, very top, um, you know, but it's again, it's one that, that very quickly could become a a pivotal race where control of the house is resting on a, on a place like that second district of Maine, you know, it's the whole Northern part of Maine. So it's pretty mm -hmm. rural. It gets up on the Canadian border. Again, it's the kind of seat um, in which, you know, when you, you know, it's the kind of seat when which majorities in the U S house of representatives are built. Um, you got to win seats like that, that kind of cross over between more suburban and more rural areas. Um, and it's the kind, you know, Jared Golden's, you know, he's, he's governed fairly moderate. Um, you know, it's, it's going to say a lot. Can moderate Democrats win or do they get pulled under by some of the more left wing parts of theirs that don't maybe necessarily appeal to those more rural kind of communities? And they end up dragging somebody like Golden down. Yeah, that's always been a challenge for Democrats to figure out how to speak to rural voters. And it's like, this guy is standing alone in many ways because he's one of two Dems to vote against the Protecting Our Kids Act. And right now, that may not be the best strategy uh, on, on the Democratic side of things. No, because... not, not. <laughs> but, but here's the thing is that for him, given the makeup of his district, right? Like, mm -hmm. if, if you're AOC or some, you know, do a more, you know, urban representing member of Congress, right, mm -hmm. from San Francisco or wherever, like you're looking at that and you're like, how can you do that and be a yeah. Democrat? On the other hand, you know, he's worried about getting reelection. And, and, and so he's he's trying to kind of balance it, I would guess. He's balancing some really hard dynamics. You're, and we'll talk about that, you know, yeah. as it relates to Virginia, because you got you got some big races there where Spanberger uh, and in, in, in the uh, Norfolk district, where they got to balance that. Yeah, yep. Um, before we talk about that, um, can we just recap some recent races? Uh, we had one yeah. in California, yep. Yeah, so Mike Garcia is one of the most vulnerable re Republican incumbents um, mm -hmm. in the country. Um, he got his primary opponent, um, and uh, his primary opponent is Christy Smith, former state mm -hmm. legislature. Legislator, you know, we have that score to 17. You know, it's a, it's a kind of seat Democrats have to win. That district has changed some. It's it's they've taken Simi Valley, uh, which is where the Reagan Library is, out of the district. Um, the, the you know the polling shows you know the race a dead heat, 44, 44, 12 percent undecided. Um, he's a huge supporter of Donald Trump, just a massive one. <sighs> And I'd love to see people come out and ask, like, hey, are you still uh, accepting this endorsement? Are you still a huge supporter? Because at well, he's, this point... he's all in. He's all yeah. in. Because he can't yeah. win otherwise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I just think, I don't know. I mean, there are some true believers, and I think Mike Garcia is a true believer. Um, 
then his district has changed. You know, there's parts of California, you know, Devin Nunez and Kevin McCarthy are from the Central Valley. So yeah. there's parts of California that aren't L.A. and San Francisco that are that are more Alabama than California. Very much so. And a lot of people often forget about that. And so when they talk about the coastal elites, it's like, ah, not so much important to pay attention to what's going on in the entire state. Um, but we do actually have some good news. There's some good signs coming out of New Mexico, right? In the house race yeah. there. So Yvette Harrell's another incumbent Republican. Um, mm. She got her opponent, Gab Vasquez. He's a former city councilor from uh, Las Cruces. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's kind of a, he's, he's actually, I think it's a, it's an example of a Democrat running in a Western state. Who's got kind of a pretty cool thing going on mm -hmm. um, in that he's running as a progressive outdoorsman. He talks about liking to hunt and conservation and, and, you know, he's not an anti-gun guy. He's, an anti-assault weapons guy, right. but he's, he's really trying to bridge common sense versus Trump crazy. Cause that's what Harold's been uh, during her time there. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, that's a race we scored 17, which it's another one. Democrats need a pickup because they're going to lose seats in some other places. Um, so, you know, he's, he could be really transformative. Like he could be good. Yeah for the progressive wing of the Democrat party and the Democrat party as a whole, in terms of, you know, showing a way that there's a path to be seen as less, you know, far left. Yeah. I was going to say, I love that kind of crossover energy where it's like, Hey, if we want to have stuff left to hunt, we have to actually protect the environment. Right. So, yeah, right. exactly. It's, it's true. All right. And then, uh, we also have, uh, New Jersey. What did we miss in New Jersey? Yeah, so in New Jersey, uh, Tom Melanowski, this is just kind of highlighting a race that's going to be out there. It's it's New Jersey 7. It's highly competitive. Tom Melanowski is a Democrat. He's a former assistant uh, secretary of state for democracy, human rights, and labor. Huge advocate. He used to be at Human Rights Watch uh, for sort of freedom, democracy, Ukraine, all those kinds of things. He's going to be running against Tom Keene Jr., uh, Tom Keene was a Republican, traditional Republican governor of New Jersey. Um, Melanowski's race is a big one, not only because it's the kind that Democrats have to win, we sort of 17, but also just kind of because of Melanowski's background. Um, he is somebody who was, who was at senior levels of the front lines of the, the global battle for democracy um, and is really somebody who gets it. And he's somebody who really was making common cause beginning on January 6th with Liz Cheney and some others who come out of that internet, you know, know that international side of what Americans have done for democracy. Um, so, you know, we view that as a really important race in part because of the personality of it and the, when what he brings to the fight, um, which elevates that race a little. Yeah, and I think that's what we have to keep coming back to everybody is remembering that this is about preserving democracy. It's like we'd love to have these policy fights, um, but right now it's about getting candidates in there who actually care about democracy and uh, re true representation and not just doing whatever the heck they want in there. It's a little bit insane that that's where we're at, but it is where we're at. Um, so uh, we have some races coming up. Can we talk about uh, Virginia? It's on the horizon. What should we be watching out for? You'd already mentioned Abigail, but could you go into that a bit more? Yeah. So Virginia, you know, it's a state that used to be one of the purple states and it's become more of a blue state in presidential mm -hmm. politics. But then you have guys like Glenn Youngkin won, right? So, you know, Republicans can win there. It's a state where sort of, uh, you know, it's a state where, as you were saying, coast kind of meets central part of the U.S. Mm -hmm. in some ways. Um, it's where where the north meets the south, too. Um, right. You got two Democrat incumbents, big races, Abigail Spanberger, former CIA operative, um, who really, you know, she upset a Republican in, down in, in Virginia, in Richmond. Um, they have totally shifted her district, so it's mm -hmm. more competitive. Um, she's up, and then Elaine Luria. Who's, who's a former uh, naval commander. You know, she mm -hmm. spent 20 years working on nuclear reactors, I think on submarines and aircraft carriers. Wow. Uh, impressive. She's a first term member uh, or second term member. Uh, both of them, she represents the district by Norfolk. They both are going to have uh, really 
you know, contentious races. And mm -hmm. what we're going to be watching there is which Republicans get through. Um, each of them, as we're kind of seeing around the country, has, has the different brands of MAGA going on. You got the Trump brand of MAGA, and then you got the Kathy for Truth super MAGA, <laughs> and then you got the mega super MAGA, right? All these candidates playing, we're going to be looking to see which ones get through um, because in that will be potential opportunity to help keep those seats um, in the pro-democracy column. And, and the threat to democracy could get greater depending on which of the candidates get through. Yeah, and I just want to take a quick note because I, I love um, also thinking about what works, right? Because we're seeing what doesn't work and when we think about what does work. And I love this crossover of women who've been prominent in the military or in the CIA. And it's all allowing to have that kind of moderate voice um, where people can kind of like say, oh, okay, this is a person who uh, we see that can re represent our values, American values, but also uh, be a compassionate leader. And so I love seeing that on the Democrat side uh, because it is important to these, you know, as you mentioned, Trigby, these states where it's like, ah, is it blue? Is it purple? Is it red? And going back and forth. And so I think um, that might be a model that could be followed in other states. I'd love to see actually a little bit more of that. Even though I said I don't want any more fighters, I want collaborators. I do think these women in the military represent collaborators um, in, a, in a very significant well, way. Here's the thing that's important. You know what they represent as well is, is how America is changing, right? Hmm. Uh, on a lot of levels, but they also represent um, a little bit different um, brand of Democrat Party, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's a case to be made that during the Reagan era, you know, an Abigail Spanberger would have been rubbing as a Republican, not as a Democrat, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of shows that transformation that's going on. Um, and, and they are critically important voices, although I will tell you, they end up bumping heads with the AOCs and the Cory Bushes and some of those factions, you know, because an Abigail Spanberger, she's a pretty moderate Democrat mm -hmm. who's pretty much in step with the people who live in her district. And the people who live in her district aren't from Queens or Long Island, right? right? Like they're, they're from a more rural part of Virginia. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, the question is, is there space in the Republican Party for anybody who isn't loyal to Trump? But there's also a question in the Democrat Party, is there space for people who don't conform to those coastal elite kind of, <laughs> kind of values? Well, we can yeah. only hope so, because that, is, that balanced uh, moving nicely through the center, I think that is where America needs to go. So hopefully we can come to our senses and ensure that we're getting principled leadership in, people who actually care about representing the actual needs of the people instead of people who are just there for a total power trip. Um, because if you're watching the hearings, like I said, y'all, this is not your grandpa's GOP. Like these aren't decent people with differing values. They're dangerous. They're cynical. They tried to overtone a, a fair election. They don't believe in democracy. And so they shouldn't be working in government. Um, that's kind of how I feel about it. If you, don't, if you don't believe in democracy, what are you doing here? Like, why are you, why are you yeah. trying to work in, 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 in this space? So um, y'all, we can't do the show uh, with out with you. We can't do the show without you. So um, everything that we do at the Lincoln Project um, is made possible by your donations. Um, and so we really, uh, we don't sell ads. We don't answer to anyone uh, but you. So with your helping call out, that was Empower and we can be fearless. So if you haven't already, please consider a donation. Nothing is too small. Uh, together, I'm convinced we can save our democracy. Uh, this is our time for today, but thanks for joining us, Trigby Olson, the LP strategist who knows how to win the game we're in, and me, Maya May, who just really, really needs us to win. We have to get, we have to stay on top of these races, y'all. We really do, um, and get the vote out every time the GOP does something crazy. Text a friend and say, "Hey, this is why we got to vote," because a lot of people aren't even following this stuff. And so now's the time where we all gotta jump in, really pitch in. It's going to take all of us. Um, follow us on Twitter. And don't forget to watch the breakdown tomorrow, Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. And then Wednesday, catch me and Lisa Senecal on We're Speaking. We have Heather Cox Richardson on, so don't miss that. Um, and we will see you.